peace of Christ be with you. In fact, I'm going to now turn this a little more because you, you who are watching at home, are the only ones here today. We're back again in this strange reality. But we've been here before, and we will endure. Before we continue worship, a couple of notes. Today is a Communion Sunday, so I encourage you, wherever you are, to go and get some elements that you'll share for that time. It could be bread and wine or juice or, in fact, anything you have on hand to celebrate that sacrament later in the service. Because this will be our reality for the foreseeable future, next week we'll be returning to our prior schedule of a pre-recorded service shown at 8.30 on YouTube. It will stay up after that, and it will go live on Facebook at 10 o'clock if you'd like to interact through the comments section and so forth. But now let us do what we always do. Slow down, take a few deep breaths, that we might be fully aware of the presence of the Spirit with us, even now, even in the midst of this. Friends, let us worship in beloved community. This is the second Sunday of Advent, and so we light our second Advent candle. And this is the candle of peace. We light the candle of peace and await its coming. We light the candle of peace and shed light on where it is needed. We light the candle of peace and hasten its arrival.
Our first scripture reading today is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her turn, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their consistency, their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and God's arm rules for her. God's reward is with her and God's recompense before her. God will feed God's flock like a shepherd. God will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in God's bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. This is holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. One of the gifts of returning to virtual worship is after this Sunday, we'll be able to return to a fuller liturgy, much of which we'd excised to have a shortened experience for those in attendance. Hard to believe we're already at the readings in the sermon. The second reading is the letter of 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 8 through the first half of verse 15. Continue to listen for what the Spirit is saying this morning. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about the Lord's promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire? But in accordance with God's promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by God at peace without spot or blemish 
and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. This too is holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Some years ago, I found myself strangely alone in my house. Sherry must have been at work or otherwise out, and I couldn't find our cats, which are exclusively indoor cats. So my mind went to the logical place one's mind goes in such moments, and I concluded that the rapture must have happened. <laughs> Sherry had made it. My cats had made it. Makes perfect sense to me, but I had not. Now, there are descriptions in Scripture of some future event such as that, where the righteous are sucked up into the clouds, into heaven, and others are left behind. Such was the obsession of some Christians in some Christian novels. And to be sure, early Christians made it a point to write about where they thought this was all going. But interestingly, they didn't all have the same ideas about that. And indeed, their ideas evolved. Paul's own ideas, as we mentioned last week, evolved on the matter. The passage you just heard from 2 Peter, among other things, attempts to answer or respond to a set of questions that was clearly swirling at the time and comes up around Advent. Namely, where was Jesus? When was he to return? When was God going to make everything right? The people of God had always been asking for God to step in and set things right. You heard it in the prophets as well. And Second Peter's answer, in part, was this. One day with the Lord is like a thousand years. A thousand years, thousands of years, then perhaps that's an awful lot of waiting. Is waiting all we're to do? That is a theme of Advent. We're just to wait? Or could there be more to our waiting than simply enduring? Well, I went down a theological and biblical rabbit hole exploring this question, as one does who thinks their cats may have been caught up in the rapture. And I came across this fascinating conversation by scholars Peter Enns, Christopher M. Hayes, and Casey Strine. And the long and the short of it, well, really just the short of it, you can thank me later for that, is that prophecy in biblical times was understood conditionally more so than temporally. And what I mean by that is, in order for some things to happen that were promised, other things needed to happen first. So it wasn't just a matter of time and automatic fulfillment, that actually, as we spoke about last week, the people had a part to play in bringing the promises of God to fulfillment. As such, delays or uh, the seeming unfulfillment of God's promises were not seen by Peter as abandonment or not making good on a promise, but quite the contrary, it was an act of graciousness of God. Listen to what he says. The Lord is not slow as some think of slowness, but is patient. That comes from verse 9. You see, God wants to give, wants to give people a chance to repent. Now, I know that word comes with a lot of baggage in the church, but it simply means to change, to turn, to correct one's course, to get on the right path. 
and God holds off to try to bring as many in as possible in that way. And in the meantime, we have a vocation. We are to live, as Scripture says, lives of holiness and godliness, which will actually hasten the coming day of God. That's the condition to be met. See, the culture at large wants us to use this season to buy stuff, to make us feel better. But as Christians, we are called to use this season to remind ourselves to do our part in helping things truly be better. Letting the old ways of heaven and earth pass away, that a new one would come where righteousness is not felt on the fringes, but righteousness is at home. There's a lot of work to be done. Maybe you caught, as I did, the headline the other day in the paper, that Marin dominates in racial segregation, says UC Study, pointing out that six of the 10 most racially segregated communities in the Bay Area are in Marin. Or maybe there are other community issues that have been elevated recently that catch your attention. Shall we just wait for them to fix themselves? Or for Christ to come back and fix them for us? Or will we accept the invitation to live lives of godliness and holiness in light of these challenges? This congregation, this community, is filled with bright, creative, caring, resourceful, resourced people. What could we be doing on these issues in our community as people of Jesus. That's what sets it apart for us. It's not Christian to equate faith with simply passively trusting that God will come and fix it all. As pastor and, and blogger uh, Chuck Queen puts it, we don't need more Christians to believe in some end-time cataclysmic shakeup. What we need desperately right now is more Christians to see the possibilities of Christ in glory here and now, to claim who they are in God and to become the body of Christ, feeding the hungry, caring for the vulnerable, healing the wounded, liberating the oppressed, and working for peace and restorative justice in the world. Another way of saying that is while we're waiting for God to show up, God is waiting for us. For us to show up not with our own messianic complexes and not with frenetic and anxious energy that often makes things worse rather than better, but rather to show up confident that if and how we do our part, God will do God's. And we just might find that when the conditions are met from our end, that the God we've been waiting for is at the door. And the cats, they're just hiding under the bed. <laughs> Amen. As we come to our time of prayer together, I do invite you, if you are watching with us on Facebook, to type into the comment section your joys, your concerns, so that we can be in prayer together today. So let us pray. 
God of abundant mercy. Though we may be physically apart, you have given us grace to pray with one heart, with one voice. And God, when our voices tremble with grief or with sorrow, comfort, comfort your holy people. Speak to us of your peace, of the balm of healing for our weary and wounded souls. And God, during this Advent season, awaken us to action. Stir us to courage. Rouse us to prepare a way in the wilderness for your coming. And God, we pray today together the prayer that your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we began our service with Rob telling you about our new former worship schedule that will begin next week. We will be uh, showing our worship video on YouTube at 8.30 and Facebook at 10. And then just a couple other things that I want to let you know about. Many of you were able to join us last Tuesday evening for the first in our Advent series sponsored by our Spiritual Life Commission. If you were not able to join in, join us this week Tuesday at 6 p.m. We'll be welcoming spiritual director Colette Lafia to share with us some of her treasured spiritual practices for Advent. If you need the Zoom link, you can find it on our website or just let me know and I will send it to you. Two weeks from today, December 20th, our Westminster kids have a special treat for you as they will be uh, presenting a drive-through nativity right out here in our parking lot. So they'll be dressed up as characters from the Christmas story and you're invited to come and drive through and both see and hear the story. You can come anytime between 1.30 and 2. And if you are a person with a child in your household who would like to participate, just let me know, and they are more than welcome. So today is the first Sunday of the month, which means we are celebrating the Lord's Supper together. If you haven't yet had a chance to get something to eat and something to drink, go do that now. And as always, when we come to the table, Jesus invites us to come to the table in peace. So may the peace of Christ be with you. May God be with you, each and every one of you. May we lift up our hearts to God and give thanks to God. Because it is right to give God thanks and praise. Let us pray. Blessings be to you, Creator God, who in the beginning brought light and life to the world and who continues to bring us love and light everlasting. Over the ages, you have called your people to embrace your hope and share your love. Even when they have closed their ears, O oh God, you have not stopped calling. You sent prophets and messengers to your people, reminding them of the promised time of peace 
and justice that would surround the world. And then you came to a young woman named Mary and laid out the promise in a new way, promising her a son who would be called Jesus, promising that through her son the world would be changed. And now, as we prepare for that child to be born, we echo the ancient cry, O come, O come, Emmanuel, come into our hearts, come into our lives. Amen. What do we do now? We've not been in a situation such as this. We've usually celebrated this all from a virtual space. Now we have a few gathered here to produce this service and most gathered away. We will not partake of the elements here. No Christian ritual should take life. It should only give it. But we trust that you will partake and we will proclaim that the next meal in which we partake will be blessed and will be the fulfillment of this sacrament. A sacrament that began like this. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread. And having given thanks, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after they had supped, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink of it, Remember me. Friends, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's saving life, death, and resurrection until he comes. I invite you now to partake. And even as you share, I offer this prayer. Holy One and Holy Three, you have met us at this table. You set up a table for us wherever we sojourn, and there you meet us in holy fellowship. You fill us, you restore us, you empower us to go out and be your weak people, feeding, restoring, nourishing, and loving. We give thanks for these gifts, and we dedicate them to you in service of you and your beloved world. Amen.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is Father and Mother of us all, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with us this day, be with us every day. Amen.